Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M by 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world for technology startups. I operate from Silicon Valley, but uh, we work with entrepreneurs from all over the world. And uh, in support of our mission of helping a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue, we do a lot of um, free mentoring roundtables. So this is the 534th session. We've had over 150,000 people participate in these over the years. We started doing these way back when in the fall of 2008, and we've kind of shown up every week, week after week after week. In, in any given year, we probably do, you know, 48 to 50 roundtables, uh, free roundtables. And then we also use uh, our uh, private roundtables for the premium members. So it's a very comprehensive uh, body of work and, and a very regular, consistent body of work that has happened on this forum. So the event is being recorded. You will find recordings of every single roundtable on our YouTube channel, 1M1M one Roundtables. On Twitter, we are at 1M by 1M and at Stromana, and today's hashtag is 1M1M. One one uh, these are the call-in instructions for today. It is a roundtable, not a broadcast, so you're very welcome to dial in. Um, we also, nowadays, can um, patch you in from the computer audio. So whichever works for you is fine. Just let us know that you want to chat and, and we'll make sure that you are on. We are going to start today's conversation with John Steinberg, Managing Partner of Steinberg Venture Partners. John, welcome back to the show. Welcome. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, just uh, got up at four this morning to fly back from San Francisco back to Seattle. So, oh wow, eager beaver I am. <laughs> so you just started, so literally. Yeah, literally. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, how have you been? How has COVID been? Is everything okay? Yeah, you know, I was just talking about that this is morning that I feel very, very lucky. Uh, I actually traveled a lot during COVID and um, got a lot of business done. And, uh, you know, it uh, uh, just, I have to say, I just feel very, very fortunate. And uh, and now it seems like we are, airports are busy again, and people are traveling yeah. eager to get out. And in fact, I hold um, investor dinners and founder dinners in San Francisco and Seattle. and getting lots of unsolicited reminders that we should get going with those again. So uh, yeah, it feels like we're oh, uh, back at it. You, you said you have been traveling uh, during the during COVID for the last year and a half. Almost. I have. I, uh, I live in both Seattle and San Francisco, so that's one natural place for me to go back and forth. And then um, I just got actually back from Puerto Rico because uh, I was interested in seeing uh, that interesting move by a lot of people who are moving there, especially people who have a lot of capital gains. So I just was there and I have uh, several upcoming trips as, as well. Interesting. All right. Well, talk about business. What uh, what changes, what has been the evolution of business, the, your portfolio, your deal flow, et cetera, through this COVID period? Well, I think the, the obvious things are that COVID, some people like to say it just accelerated what was naturally happening. Um, you know, when, and, it, and it really was widespread. So my doctor friends tell me that they, I remember them saying in the beginning of COVID that they had accomplished more changes in 10 weeks than they had in the previous 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Education. I heard that from a lot of people. Yeah, right. So it, it crossed all industries. Yeah. And uh, and I think you know when forced to change our lifestyles and our engagement patterns, many people said this isn't so bad. I have been absolutely astonished at um, just the 
the the winners have won so big during COVID. Um, the tech stocks in particular, anybody that could scale, uh, but also just uh, people rethinking work patterns, life patterns, social patterns. Uh, yeah. So I think, uh, but having said that, I don't know a person unless they actively sought to be slower or sought to take time off. I don't know a person who said they weren't busier during COVID um, because it was so easy to do things like this. So the, so, the um, of deal flow and the amount of uh, deals getting done and startups off the charts. Are there um, some salient points of uh, how your portfolio in particular has um, gained through COVID? And if you could just double click into some use cases of specific companies, what is their business and, and what have you seen? You know, what kind of. Yeah, I would say, I would say, and this is a bit of a guess, but you know, more than three quarters of the businesses benefited during this time as their businesses ramped up. Uh, several of them, and uh, on a personal note, as you may remember, I'm in the wine business. Um, yeah. It's a pretty interesting example, actually, because my Hand of God brand behind me um, it actually got quite hurt. Uh, because we were doing 75 dinners a year and in 60 restaurants. Well, those, mm -hmm. went, to, those went to zero, right? So, yeah, yeah. but I'm also an advisor to a, a startup online wine business called Underground Sellers. Their mm -hmm. business 8 x Well, right? Because that was, they were focused, they didn't have... Uh, a need to be in the restaurants or doing events. Right. They were all online. And we were just amazed to watch the numbers go up, up, and up. And so the I think the wine ind industry, as an example, that's not high tech, but you know, I consider Hand of God a startup, um, is undergoing some really interesting changes um, and forcing forcing everybody to relook at um, and the introduction of new products. Uh, that didn't slow down. It just, uh, you know, I have friends who um, I just helped a startup adaptogenic mushroom coffee company that, again, mm -hmm. uh, was able to use a, you know, this is a small example, but was able to take a cafe that had been closed during COVID and is going to re-engineer this cafe to be a showcase. It's called Wonderground, a showcase for their product launch. So those mm -hmm. those are real world smaller examples, if you will. Um, but uh, another company I'm really excited about um, is a company that is taking analog assets and converting them to digital. Uh, so buying up, uh, and this is in the I'll call it the outdoor active space. So think of, mm -hmm. think of runners and hikers and rock climbers and uh, skiers, that, that category. And there's yeah. a bunch of interesting assets out there, magazines, for example, that, yeah. that now all need to be digitized and brought up to uh, the current world around social media and interaction. And this company called Outdoor is doing that and COVID again accelerated their opportunities. So, mm -hmm. so it's it really you know that the, not to be cliche, but people talk about the haves and the have-nots, right? And I think in the startup world, uh, it became very much an accelerant. If 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 COVID worked to your benefit, it really worked to your benefit. And if it didn't, it, it, you either had to go out of business or pivot or something had to change. Yeah. So, oh, um, what is your current uh, strategy uh, going forward, given this, you know, humanity has never changed behavior at such pace, as you pointed out earlier, and as we're seeing everywhere in every dimension of life, this has been a real change enforcer. So, how do 
do you park that and what is your investment thesis going forward? What are you looking to invest in and what would be the strategy? Yeah, so I was extremely active during the last year, personally, as an angel. But I yeah. also, uh, but I also um, have changed my own personal strategy around uh, a few ways to invest. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, let's just take it at, at the highest level. I've said this for a while now that it used to be the case that technology was rolling out in a serial linear fashion. But that is no longer the case. We are at this really interesting inflection point that I'm not sure most people totally understand because it's so big that every industry is being impacted and it's not being impacted by one technology, but a variety of technologies. So, you know, if you go back and you look at the, the transition to personal computers or the transition to uh, networks, or the transition uh, to the internet. It, it, you know, this was a serial rollout, one technology feeding it. Now we have, gosh, you, you could pick, there are 20 industries, I don't care if it's healthcare or education or FinTech or travel, or I mean, let's, you know, let's name the industry, they are being transformed. And it is simply impossible as an investor for me to uh, be able to, to be on top of each one of those. So, yeah. so I believe, you know, not, not a terribly deep thought, but I believe that crypto and blockchain are fundamentally hugely important technologies and I need to be exposed to it from an investment strat standpoint. So okay. uh, instead of saying, I'm gonna bet on this horse and that horse, I went out and found the best uh, blockchain fund of funds to mm -hmm. allow me the best exposure. And I've actually become a venture partner with them. And we are mm -hmm. in some 15 funds globally. That's the other point you asked me, what's my, mm -hmm. you gotta be global now. Yeah. It, it is no longer 650415, right? It's, it's global thinking. You gotta think about, uh, and it's, and it's, across the country as well. So the blockchain co-investors, you know, I'll have exposure to 300 different startups because I couldn't possibly know how to uh, pick by myself. And in the uh -huh. previously, I would have tried to figure it out and focus just on that. But it is such a fundamental technology that not having exposure, I think is, is really gonna be missing something so important. That's one example. Another example is uh, I'm a, a venture partner with a global venture fund called Rocketship.vc. And their approach is unique. They are, and but I think everybody will take on this approach in some form going forward. And that is, these guys are rocket scientists, literally. They're data scientists from Stanford. And they are just using algorithms and homing through, I can't remember the amounts now, it's such a, a huge amount of data, and looking for patterns to find startups around the world to invest in. So they're getting, they're getting a look at the world in a different way and faster. And uh, the approach has been really interesting. It appears that they're going to be in the top 5% of all funds for their vintage year. And so, again, that's my way to get exposure to things I wouldn't be able to otherwise. Yes, I still invest in um, startups as an angel investor, mostly here and in the Bay, here in Seattle and in the Bay Area. But mm -hmm. I have never seen so many startups, you know, I must get uh, through syndicates, I must get five new opportunities a day online. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it is so fascinating to me and I can't possibly uh, do the work, make a decision around that. But uh, so what I was about to say is that 
my own strategy is um, I I definitely am only something over the transom more than ever won't work. And uh, working with people that I know or have a group of people that we all know is is really important to me. And then, you know, I have the luxury, I'll say that at this point in my life, having done this for over 30 years, uh, yeah. I, I get to I get to focus on things that. You know, so I like the people. I feel like it's an interesting category just for my own personal interest, and hopefully it's doing something good in the world um, uh, to make a difference. So that all goes. Go ahead. What are those areas of personal interest to you currently? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm really besides wine. Besides wine. <laughs> so uh, I'll tell you an area that I. Um, I just don't know nearly enough about, but you know, another one of the massive categories. I feel like if you're not in it and you're not a, part a participant, you don't know how ridiculously large and exciting it is. That's gaming. But mm -hmm. people in my generation generally don't get that this is, is changing the world in so many ways. So I invested in a company called Manticore. And it's a, a, a Stanford guy um, that I had gotten to know through his blogs and his posts, and and I just saw his passion, and and it, but it, but I got to know him over time, and uh, I had no idea because I'm not a gamer, but mm -hmm. love, by the way, I love sports. Um, I'm a ticket yeah. I'm a ticket stub collector, and the whole NFT thing is super interesting to me, but. Um, I I just saw his approach and his passion. So I made the bet on him because I need some exposure to this category. Because um, mm -hmm. it's going to change. And I mentioned the sports because I think esports is part of this category. So yeah. that's an example of a passion of mine, working uh, with somebody who brings that kind of thoughtfulness and depth and passion to a category I'm just never going to be terribly smart in, but I, but I relate to it. So that'd be, that'd mm -hmm. be an example. Um, I do love things, uh, the whole cat, another huge category that I'm really excited about, but again, I can't spend the time, is space, space and aviation. Oh my gosh, you, you know, there's the obvious ones around space, but there's a lot of, I, I invested in a classmate from uh, Stanford um, who's doing really interesting things. This is tangential but around weather and gathering data on weather uh, from satellites that previously weren't being uh, shared or aggregated or consumed in the way that he's doing it. And they're growing really fast. Weather is changing so rapidly in the world, right? That's an example. Mm -hmm. I have another friend that, and I'm sorry, I get really excited about this so if I'm speaking too fast, but another friend that is, he's just made me rethink how transportation, especially around small airports and hybrid airplanes, is going to change everything, right? If we can't, if it doesn't matter where you live, how will the world change? And to think about that, and what is the infrastructure required for that? And so I invested in a really interesting cargo drone company that it will uh, produce drones that can carry, you know, 500 pounds and really solve some of the supply chain and emergency relief situations in a way that's never been able to before. Um, so again, just so many exciting things. Um, I feel like a kid in the candy store a little bit because uh, there has never been a time like this. The next, I, keep, I have a 13 year old daughter and I keep thinking when she graduates from college, I don't even know how to prepare her for that moment in 10 years because it's going to be so radically different. I feel like hang on, it's going to be quite a ride. Yeah. So uh, when you do angel investments directly, not through fund of funds and all that, yeah. what five checks are you writing these days? You know, uh, it's kind of it, it's kind of really all over the map. I don't have a particular check size. Um, uh, and because it's and because I don't have unlimited wealth, and because it's all from my account, uh, I tend to do a smaller, uh, more. And you know, I always try and think, how am I adding value? That that's actually the more yeah. important question 
uh, I didn't mention that when you asked me my criteria, but you know, someone the other day said to me, what do you do all day? Because I'm involved in so many different things. And I think the thing that I do all day is I really work hard and not to lose what I'll call my super connector superpower. That I really want to make sure that um, I'm also an obsessive walker. So I average 25,000 steps a day. But the only way yeah. you can possibly do that is if you take walking meetings. So mm -hmm. at least at least three to five of my walking um, bouts each day is just calling people I haven't spoken to for a while and connecting yeah. or uh, reading an article online about a cool startup and just reaching out. I remember in uh, 1988 when I first moved to um, Seattle to work for Microsoft. Out of the blue, I called up Howard Schultz and said, "You don't know me, but I think Starbucks is pretty cool, and I would love it if you would uh, just have a coffee with me." Which he did, and I just never <laughs> lost that. So my value add to go back to that is, is I want to be that person on the cap table that people can say, hey, could you do this introduction for me? Because yeah. I encourage people to, to use LinkedIn and to see who I'm connected to. And, uh, and I'm super respectful of, of, uh, of using that power to not bother people and to, and to filter and to curate. But that's my, I think that in the end of the day, hopefully I've got some pattern recognition around what, you know, boardroom behavior and what makes a good startup. And <clears throat> I'm an insatiable podcast listener. I'm always learning. Uh, but I think uh, that for me, if I can add value, then that's more important than the check size. And um, do you, would you price around or would you kind of write the term sheet? Do you lead? Yeah, generally at this point, I used to a lot. And uh, at this point, I'm not doing that. Uh, because uh, I know that I'm not going to be, I mean, to help in a situation, in an unusual situation, I'd rather see a focused institutional uh, firm. Me, pricing is not the signal I want to give to the market. Meaning, mm -hmm. I'd like to find a firm that's focused on that particular category, or that type of startup, or that set, uh, stage, to price it. So that people can get behind that and say, okay, they've done deep, deep due diligence. They're going to be very involved. Let's let's see what they're saying. The market bears. Also, I, I feel like, um, and I don't I don't have good stats to back this up, but valuations have really uh, been all over the map. And yeah. compared compared to when I was pricing rounds, uh, I still get a little heartache over uh, valuations. I'll be completely honest with you. In fact. I was asked to price around recently and I felt like it was way too high. Um, I said that I was going to invest. I like the people a lot and it ended up. We found it amazingly and the price was higher. So, so. But, but companies are. Well, also, there is evaluation inflation going on. There's no question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, but a company there's, you know, markets speak fairly. Um, fairly efficiently sometimes, and there is a ability to scale today like we've never seen before. So that's got to get reflected in that price. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a lot of infrastructure already in place, and if there are ways to tap into that infrastructure to grow, that is, it's an unprecedented situation. Um, this is true. Sure, for sure. And around the world, you know, rocket ship, oh, yeah. rocket ship, part of their data that they did not expect when they went in and started looking at the data was that India represented one of the most interesting opportunities in the world and had been under We know them very well. Um, Anand and Venki, we know them very well. I've known Venki for, I don't know, 20 some years. Um, so yes, we, we're familiar with their work and, and you know, as for us, Actually, I was very involved in, in from the very beginning of the Indian startup ecosystem and moving from the services based uh, industry to the product based startup based industry. So, so our you, penetration into India is huge. So, yes, we are very familiar with the India opportunity. Well, but but 5 years ago, it was under invested. 
that's what's so interesting. And, you know, with the introduction of the low cost cell phone and other things that it just changed what seemed like overnight. Yeah, so just yeah. super interesting, but that's an example of if you weren't on top of that, you missed it. I mean, not that there's not going to be continued opportunity, but that was a that was a mega trend. So, yeah. Yeah. We are even seeing companies coming from Africa these days. 100%. We had our first unicorn out of Africa. I know several fund managers in Africa. I mean, it's again, the, the world is shrinking in a way. You know, yes. my, I have a friend who pointed out to me about a year and a half ago. He said, another mega trend that people don't realize is there's seven and a half billion people in the world ish. And he said, this was, this was probably two years ago. He said, through half or about 3.5 to 3.8 had internet access. He said, but within five years, no time at all, everybody has internet access. Yeah. Think about how that changes the world. Yeah. And and so uh, again, the scaling opportunity doubled overnight. In, in, yeah. in, I mean, five years is not very long and that rollout is happening. So what a fascinating time. Yeah, and those are, uh, you know, when you, the India story is interesting because the first wave of the India, India B2C, India facing B2C businesses were targeting the affluent consumer base. And then as Reliance Geo got into the game and, and this whole, you know, hundreds of millions of lower end consumers got plugged into the internet, the game changed. Of course, they have no purchasing power, but right. so you have to go to market in ways that are, you know, interesting and different, and and you have to figure out what kind of business models work. But there's a lot of opportunity for innovating on business models there. A hundred percent. And and you know, I think there was a, a stage of of tech rollout around the world that was basically copy what what worked in the U.S. and see if it worked in your yes. country. And that is we no longer. No, that's no longer the case. Right. Some of that may still be there, but I think there's original work happening. And and I think the ecosystems have matured tremendously and the dynamics and the trends are different uh, in that there is there's actually opportunities for original innovation, original ideas that are that are quite prolific at the moment in and those pro geographies. Profound. I mean really profound because different places profound. require different solutions, different cultures. Are going to use the technology in different ways, so you know. I, yeah, I'm, and and I think there's leapfrogging going on. You know what the the whole COVID COVID induced change that has happened. I mean, it's changing and creating lots of opportunities in the Western world in the developed nations, but it has also helped the emerging markets leapfrog into that changed behavior of online learning, distance learning, telehealth. E-commerce, all these have completely leapfrogged. That's correct. That's correct. And I don't, I don't think that stops anytime soon, right? No, 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 not at all. So. Not at all. All right. Well, John, great catching up with you. I will be sending you something shortly. We are working on a, on a very uh, early stage deal that I will send you. I love it. Well, I, coming from you, you know it'll go to the top of my list. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Stay safe. If you're traveling around, stay safe. There's this Delta variant that I'm a little bit concerned about because it's playing havoc in India. Yeah, and no. I have a lot of family in India. We've had a lot of problems. I'm sorry about that. I would encourage you to drink Hand of God because I hear it really is effective against COVID. <laughs> Thank you. I will remember that. In the meantime, it was nice to have coffee with you this morning. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Take care. See you. Bye bye. Okay, folks, um, we're going to do an entrepreneur uh, pitch session next. Remember, this is a safe working session. No other agenda. We have absolutely no other agenda other than helping you accelerate your venture. So feel free to tell us what is it that you are struggling with or what is it that you want to ask, input, ask for input on. And uh, I'll do my best to give you absolutely unfiltered um, input. Um, Remember, if you disagree with my feedback, that's fine. You do what you want. It's your venture, you do what you want. Take the feedback, consider the feedback, see how you want to process that feedback, and then decide what you want to do. 
We're going to start with Chandra from Helsinki, Finland. That is very interesting. Chandra, how did you end up in Helsinki? Tell us more. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad to connect with you and thanks a lot for this opportunity, Shramana. Hopefully my audio is clear. Yes, we can hear you fine. Great. So I'm from India, but I've been living in Europe for the last um, 12 years. I've been working here in IT. Um, I I was in Germany and then I shifted to Finland. Um, I've been working with an IT company here. And then um, the whole concept of Hudoop happened and um, actively working, um, just bootstrapped it and uh, all excited to launch it next month. And happy to share how this whole journey started for me. Fantastic. What is Hudoop? Uh, so Hudoop is a location-based mobile platform that connects users with home chefs for multiple food experiences. Um, before I go uh, deep into what Hudoop is, I want to just start off with uh, giving you a view in terms of how this whole idea started, um, as it's mentioned in the next slide. Um, I spent a good part of my life uh, away from home, uh, close to 15 years studying outside, working outside, um, and every time I've always longed for home food, right? I yeah. hated going to restaurants and sometimes I hated cooking, so I always wanted to get home food close to me. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a trigger point for the problem, as you can see in the next slide that I mentioned. Um, as I started traveling more for my business, um, and by the way, uh, is the slide going to be moved by someone? Um, okay, great. So so that's, that's a bit about the problem. So uh, continuing on from where I left off, um, so I always longed for home food and then even for business travels when I used to go to multiple countries. I always wanted to find that one authentic local uh, family with whom I could share food, socialize, and discover the culture of food. And that was a whole trigger point. And clearly restaurants were not able to deliver this, right? And that led to the whole concept of food loop, um, as it is mentioned in the next slide. Um, I started driving this vision by speaking to multiple people, um, folks, family, friends, uh, colleagues, and um, getting their opinion as to whether this idea of uh, sharing food with home chefs or buying food from home chefs um, is a great concept. And I got confidence in building something like this. And just to put a bit of a practicality to vision, I just started exploring um, families, uh, bachelors, uh, young working couples, uh, homemakers and so on and mm -hmm. so forth as to what kind of what kind of, how would they want to use uh, if they were given a platform where they can buy experiences from uh, a home chef and broadly it led to these four features that i'm building right now uh, families typically want to uh, connect with new families uh, over food they want to socialize with a new family discover local culture and so on and so forth so that led to the concept of eating with home chef family uh, young couple, uh, bachelors, working people who uh, typically are the restaurant goers, uh, their motivation for buying from home chef was someone who can just good, make good home food and just deliver it to me. And I would love to have it instead of buying it from restaurant. And then there were people who were actually having parties and events and gathering at home, and they would love to have a good authentic chef who would just come over and cook food at their home. And plus, of yeah. course, there are so many people who are actually trying to explore food, right? Homemakers, they wanted to explore something new, learn something new. And something like YouTube was not offering a live personalized experience. And they said, hey, if a home chef can invite me over, we can cook together, learn together, taste together, and talk and connect. That would be a great mm -hmm. concept for me to have. And I thought, okay, let me pick up these four and start building my platform with distinct use cases and distinct customer base. Sandra, let me point out one thing. Yeah. You have been, I don't know if, you, if it's deliberate or if you have any order um, thinking here. I would swap one and two. I would put delivery by home chef as number one and then eat with home chef or rent a chef, all that uh, later because, or maybe Put delivery by home chef one, rent a chef two, and then eat with home chef three. Um, and, and the reason being, we are in this COVID era, and it's not done yet, right? COVID is not yeah. done yet. So, uh, so this 
people are not going to feel so comfortable going into a stranger's home and all of that stuff or having strangers come into your own home for the moment. Yes. However, I mean, cooking food and having somebody pick it up thats or, or delivering it, that's all very, very, very much in the game, part of the process. It's already happening. So that's probably more your starting point and maybe in about 18 months or so, this other stuff kicks in gear, but you can start building relationships with the community of chefs and people who want to buy from these chefs um, already now. I'm so glad you so said that because that's the kind of feedback I've been getting from multiple people I've been speaking as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that and I agree. Um, yeah. Uh, the market's fairly significant at the end of the day, it's a uh, food, so we are looking at trillions of uh, segments, but then I wanted to focus only on the full service because the quick service, the non-commercial and the cafes and bars is sort of uh, not what I'm looking for. So uh, within the serviceable market of full service, I am looking at a specific age group of 18 to 49, which roughly constitutes about 40%. And mm -hmm. um, I'm targeting about 0.4% market share by 2025. Um, that means about Two billion dollars of uh, transactions happening over Foodoop as a platform. The business model is commission. So, so, what is your geographical penetration strategy? Uh, I'm starting with pilot uh, with a few countries, as I would cover in the subsequent slides. Um, I really want to start small. Identify a few countries: India, Finland, UK, Singapore, and Israel. Uh, those are the countries I'm planning to pilot okay. and then scale up. Okay. You have to identify one country, not only one country, you have to identify one city and start piloting. I because did. this is yeah. very localized stuff, right? You have to get both sides. It's like a two-sided marketplace. You have to get both sides of the marketplace on your platform for transactions to happen. So spreading thin and going to a lot of countries and a lot of places doesn't serve you anything. You have to go city by city by city so that people can you know, there's critical mass of transactions, there's critical mass of word of mouth spread, spreading, all of that. So you have to pick one city and start it in one city. Yes, really I agree, agree, Shamana. For India, I picked up Chennai. And as you, as you rightly said, uh, I need to get the seller base and the consumer base hand in hand because one cannot work without the other. And that's the reason I've been um, speaking to the seller base and the uh, buyer base for Chennai and similarly for Helsinki here. And that's the kind of strategy that I'm working on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, going to next, so there's a very quick view of how the app is going to look like, uh, fairly simple and straightforward. You'll have almost a similar experience to what uh, happens in an Airbnb. Uh, just search for what you want to eat, yeah. uh, find the chefs near you, see the ratings, uh, schedule, and then good to go. That's pretty much how the app. Is going to work. Next slide. Um, lots of players are already existing. Uh, the way I'm differentiating obviously is to have a rich product, mobile based, simple chicken checkout. Uh, I want to throw uh, on sustainability as a focus, promote free sharing of food, gamify how much water they have conserved, CO2 they have conserved. But importantly, I'm trying to build a community of strong chefs scale them up yes. to provide the right experience and not just That's focus right. on product. That's right. I, I mean, if you apply your model to my uh, area, let's say the Bay Area, I would want to know what chefs do you have and, and what is their expertise, and, and that would be the most interesting for me. Yeah, and that takes a hell of time and interesting amount of time being spent with home chefs, talking to them and understanding what they're doing today and so on and so forth. So yeah, I agree with you. Right. And right, what so, is their capacity? How much can they handle? Uh, exactly. There are very good, I'm sure they're very good cooks. They're not chefs, they're cooks, they're home cooks. But, uh, but understanding the wealth of home cooks talent is, is something that is it's a non-trivial job, and and I think if you can if you can put that together, I think it would be very interesting. But uh, but yeah. it, it, it is non-trivial. Yes, and in fact, when I was starting off, uh, well, yeah, uh, just a quick view of the timeline. I bootstrapped it, the design was on. Um, I couldn't get a co-founder, unfortunately, but I thought, okay, I'll just start off with a couple of college grads who are helping me build the product. Um, I onboarded chefs in parallel. I onboarded uh, buyers in parallel. And they are beta testing my product uh, this month as we speak. 
and I'm targeting 15th of July to launch it um, in Android and iOS. So uh, this, I, as I pointed out, I think the flaw in your thinking is that you're saying India, Finland, Singapore, Israel. Let's say you get a chef uh, in Chennai and you get a bunch of customers in Mumbai. How does that help you? You have to be hyper-localized and, and just launch city by city. That is the single biggest flaw in everything that you presented today is that. Sure, 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 Shamana. I will definitely take a note of it. Um, for customer acquisition strategy, for me, uh, with a zero marketing budget, uh, I thought it was going to be difficult, but it was not. I was amazed at the number of home chefs who are actually doing this business today via Instagram, via Facebook, Marketplace, via WhatsApp. Um, so I looked at all these channels. And then, of course, um, after COVID scenario opened up in Finland, I went to restaurants and I started interviewing people over there. But hey, would you want to try um, um, using the platform for making home-cooked food? And that's how I've been onboarding all the sellers and the buyers for my platform at this point of time. Um, I have kept a marketing budget. Once the platform is launched, I plan to look at uh, a few other options like SEO and uh, referrals and so on and so forth. So, uh, so one thing, the, the main thing that you need to do in whichever city you're going to go into, whichever neighborhood you're going to go into is find a critical mass of cooks first. Sure. Always trying to do a two-sided marketplace, you need to find the the sell side first, get enough sell side, get the critical mass of the sell side, and then the buy side comes from that. Because if you don't have the sell side, the buyers have nothing to buy. The sell side comes first because the sell side is looking for marketing. And that's yeah. where you'll be able to convince the sell side to come on board first. Got it, you're so right. Take your point. Uh, I built a traction, um, and that's a base that I'm starting off with. Um, and I continue to speak uh, speak to them, and the number keeps going up. There are a few risks, however. It's a regulated um, business, Shramana, and that's something that I learned. Yeah, no, one second, one second, one second. Let's let's just go back to your um, slide on sure. acquisition, and um, there are lots and lots and lots of Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups. Yes. That are um, of you know people exchanging recipes and and obviously these are people who like to cook. So I would strongly recommend that you go into those you know those groups and start testing your ideas. And I think you would be able to very efficiently recruit cooks for those geographies. Yeah. So if it's Chennai, go into Go into cooking groups and recipe groups in, on Facebook and and go start speaking people from Chennai and you know explain your concept, see what people have to say and and see where you can get critical mass of cooks and then get that's how that will get you started. Sure, thank you for that, Shamana. Um, okay. The single biggest risk I'm fighting with is to um, ensure that the chefs are registered. It's a regulated industry. Most of the countries ask that the home chefs register their business in the local authorities. And surprisingly, a lot of people who are actually selling food on Facebook Marketplace are not aware of that. And just to ensure that I'm doing this business ethically, uh, socializing this whole concept of registration and still ensuring that they're on board is one of the biggest challenges that I'm working on. But I'm putting together a kit at a country level uh, to ensure that they're able to scale up fast. <laughs> If a, if a home cook decides to cook for 10 other people in the neighborhood or in the community, does it really need registration? The moment uh, they are making money out of it, it's illegal. California uh, okay. has just recently passed a regulation um, a few years back where they regulated, regulated where? this. In, in, I mean, by default, it is illegal, but slowly countries are opening up and making it I, legal. I this is not a factor in Chennai at all. I don't think the Indian cities have all this regulation. I mean, I have a caterer. I, I do a very, um, you know, beautiful Diwali party every year. I haven't done it last year. 
You'll be um, surprised that in India, even selling a 10 rupees of uh, food item will need to have a certificate. Even though the certificate itself is so easy to procure, but it okay. is supposed to be done. Yeah. And okay. it took a phenomenal amount of time for me to read through the countrywide regulations and be aware that what are the processes and protocols to follow. Right, which, which is why I think your idea of launching in multiple countries and multiple cities is just not a good idea. Yeah, sure. So that's the number one blind spot. I think you're, yeah. you're completely going spray and pray, whereas you need to really be focusing on geography by geography and really validating the model in one place yeah. and making it work. Then you know all the, all the issues that it takes to launch a place, you will understand the unit economics. And, and it, there's no point getting cooks everywhere without get, completing the loop. Once you get a critical, let's say you get 10 cooks in Chennai, go get 100 customers in Chennai and let that thing start to roll. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, noted, Pramana. The second aspect was consumer preference. I mean, it's so diverse. Uh, you go 400 kilometers uh, from where I am, the consumer preference changes. Germany has a completely different way of looking at this and so on. So well, understanding- which is, why, which is why this is a very neighborhood oriented business, right? Somebody yeah. who's, even the cooks don't want to go too far to deliver, right? It's kind of inconvenient. Right, so, exactly. Uh, we have this service, I don't know if you have that in Europe, we have the service called Next Door. Um, which are which is neighborhood oriented services in America, and that's the kind of place where a, a, a home chef would advertise and say that hey I'm cooking, and it's not even advertise. They'll just put a post and say hey I cook and I'll deliver food if you want, etc. And, and then the neighborhood will just it's like where we buy local services, gardeners and you know housekeepers yeah. and so on and so forth. So. All right, good. I, I like your idea. I think you have something there, but everything is going to be about execution. Please don't, you know, don't go spread yourself thin and blow your execution opportunity. Sure. Thank you so much for your feedback, Shamana. You're most welcome, Chandra. Good luck. Thank you. Folks, if you like the approach of how we operate here, as you can see, it's very candid feedback, very direct feedback, but very actionable feedback. That's the whole premise of 1 million by 1 million and the online mentoring that we do. So um, send other entrepreneurs to us if you think they are looking for this kind of uh, help. All the resources for one million, from 1 million by 1 million are at 1mby1m.com. There's a terrific blog. There's the Entrepreneur Journey's book series. Um, these are a dozen books, case study based books. Uh, you can definitely look them up. Um, our free roundtables, these roundtables happen every week. Um, you can most certainly come as many times as you want. You can pitch once, but you can come as many times as you want. Our full acceleration program is one and by one and premium. You can get extensive methodology guidance. We have a full digital curriculum. You can get help with business development and strategy consulting, and we also help you with financing. We work with hundreds of investors. So go dig around on the website, look at the self-assessment. These are due diligence questions investors ask, and uh, you need to be able to answer these questions if you're looking to raise money. If you get stuck, um, please go do the 1M by 1M basic, which is our curriculum only option and plug your knowledge gaps. We would like you to do our bootstrapping course. That's a free one-hour course that you will find on the blog pinned to the top. So that explains very much um, in, in a lot of detail the philosophy of 1 million by 1 million. That's pretty much it. You can go dig around on the website and look at what to expect from premium, basic. We have FAQs, video FAQ, description of the curriculum. It is a case study-based program, so we, we really lean on the people who have done before entrepreneurship successfully to come and teach. Uh, you have tons of case studies to learn from. We have very specific policies on investor introductions that is also available on the website. You can look it up. Our methodology is lean capital efficient bootstrap startups and our philosophy is bootstrap first raise money later. 
And that's pretty much it. The upcoming free roundtables are June 17th, 24th, and 31st. And um, that's all I have for today. If anybody has questions or would like to, you know, have a conversation on anything else, please let us know in public chat. Anybody, questions? Anything that you want to weigh in on? Anything that you want to discuss? If you want to introduce yourself, you can do that as well. And of course, if you're looking for a slot to actually have a conversation like Chandra just did, uh, please register to pitch on the website and we will put you on the schedule. So by the way, um, I don't know if you've seen it, we have started releasing a lot of the 1M by 1M methodology as short courses on Udemy. So there are about 20 courses already on Udemy. You can start using those, and we will, be, we will keep releasing more um, on a regular basis going forward so that one of the goals of that was to make something very affordable available for at least to get your bearing uh, and at, a, at scale. So, you know, today we have a community of half a million people um, with Udemy and, and other partnerships that we are working on right now we are looking to get to about 10 million students who can learn our methodology without, you know, needing to be on our schedule or, or so on. So these are self-learning courses. They're three to four hour, hours each, maybe five hours, but they're very rich. Like each course is really rich on the topic that we're dealing with and uh, has lots of case studies. Each course has a lot of case studies. So you will learn a lot of, you know, material through those case studies. And um, they, we've priced them at $39.99. And Udemy actually offers a lot of promotions. So, so you could, if you keep an eye on the promotions, you can get these courses for, you know, 10 to 15 bucks per piece. So if you decide to spend $100 on these Udemy courses, and if you watch for the promotions, you can pick up like 10 courses and, and learn a lot. So uh, it's, you know, further push in our effort to democratize entrepreneurship education and our methodology in particular. So um, please check those out. I don't see any questions. I don't see any hands up. So um, thank you very much for coming today, and we look forward to seeing you again soon next week, maybe. Bye-bye. Take care. Be safe. Most importantly, be safe. Bye.